Spatial error model, the second case, same rationale. We start with a model for the error term. We assume multivariate normal distribution. We need the Jacobian to go from the error term to the observed y variable. And then we write out the likelihood function and we maximize the likelihood function. The general solution for this is something that falls under the rubric of feasible generalized least squares. And as we saw yesterday, in feasible generalized least squares, what you need in the estimation is the inverse of the variance matrix. The variance matrix, as we saw yesterday for a, a SAR error process, is the sigma squared i minus lambda w prime i minus lambda w inverted. So in the FGLS process, we use the inverse of this, which gets rid of the inverse operator and basically boils down to what we call a spatially weighted least squares, which I'll show you in a minute. The distinction between the lag model and the error model is that in the lag model, the row, the spatial autoregressive parameter, is actually a substantive parameter of interest. In the error model, the parameter is often referred to as a nuisance parameter in the following sense. We're not really interested in this parameter for its own sake. But what we're interested in is using the parameter to get a better estimate of the beta parameters, the actual parameters in the main model. And this is a very useful result because as it turns out, in order to get an improved estimate for the beta parameters, all we need is a consistent estimate for the nuisance parameter. Consistent meaning that in the limit it reaches the correct value. There is no implication, there is no requirement, I should say, of efficiency. So you can use an estimate for the nuisance parameter that is lousy in terms of efficiency. As long as it's consistent, this result, this very powerful result, shows that using the nuisance parameter estimate in the main model will improve on the estimate of the main model on the betas. So consistency only, not necessarily efficiency. Now, of course, you might be able to do better if it's efficient as well, but that's not the main requirement. So then we end up with our spatially weighted least squares, which is, if we look at the generalized least squares expression, this is just generic x prime sigma inverse x all together inverted times x prime sigma inverse y. In the spatial case, we substitute sigma inverse is i minus lambda w prime i minus lambda w. So then, in essence, this, become, this becomes x star, where x is a spatially filtered x variable, prime x star times inverted times x star prime y star, y, where y star is a spatially filtered y variable. So this is given lambda, given an estimate for the nuisance parameter, this is a straightforward OLS-like operation. We just create the spatially filtered variables and run them in an OLS. The key question is, where does the estimate for lambda come from? Is this in any Yes, yeah. This is, and it's actually, rather than a chapter, I would go to the chapter 26, the review paper. That is about 75 page review paper, and it just spells it out as well. So this is the idea um, for a spatial autoregressive error. As we saw yesterday, if the error is moving average, then we're in trouble because then we don't have this simplifying result that we end up with the spatially filtered variables, but instead we have a big inverse in the middle. So we have x prime and then i plus rho w plus w prime plus rho square w w prime, that whole thing inverted, which is the inverse of an n by n matrix, and we know enough, right? That's going to be near impossible to do. But if it's an autoregressive process, 
we have this, and the feasible GLS then is to replace lambda by a consistent estimate. The difference between this case and the time series case is that there is no straightforward, obvious, easy to find consistent estimate for the parameter. The time series approach is you run another OLS on the residuals, but you can't do that here. Because OLS is not consistent in the spatial lag model, and this is a spatial lag model. So you have to go all out, and you have to com obtain a consistent estimate for lambda in some other way. Now, the other way that we'll see in a few minutes is the maximum likelihood approach. An alternative to do to that is a generalized moments approach. So in a generalized moments approach, you set up moment conditions and moment equations, solve for those, and find a consistent estimate for lambda, then plug that in here, and you're done. In the maximum likelihood, we will write out the likelihood for the whole thing and maximize for everything, both lambda and beta all at the same time. So we actually don't do the two-step process. It's all estimated jointly. That's the difference between the two. <coughs> you were saying that for an, uh, an SMA that there are problems. So is that just that you cannot do the spatially weighted least squares? Yes, the problem is primarily uh, in the spatial moving average. The problem in estimation is a computational one. In that, in each, see, this, I mean, to solve, to maximize this likelihood, you need to iterate. Like you try a value of the parameters, then you improve the value of the likelihood, and you keep recomputing this over and over. Um, in the moving average model, the matrix that is in here as the covariance matrix actually has an inverse term in it. So at each iteration, you have to compute an inverse of an n by n matrix, which is a tough thing to do. And there is no real, as far as I know, there's no simplification of that process. So how would you go about estimating an SMA? Well, if you have a powerful computer and your data set is not too large, you can brute force it. But it's going to take, well, I mean, everything is rel relative. You know, if you have a cluster with a thousand compute nodes, you know, you're smiling, right? If you have a little PC and that is 10 years old, you know, forget it, right? So, but that's, that's where the line is. It, it's a purely compute, it's not a conceptual problem. It's not a methodological problem, it's a computational problem. And similarly, with the, the SAR errors, you know, before we had alternatives to the eigenvalue solution, it was also a computational problem. And, and for practical purposes, you could not estimate a model if your data set was larger than 1,000 or 2,000 observations because the eigenvalue approach broke down for those. Okay, so if you have a fast cluster then can, that can invert very large matrices, you can estimate the SMA model. Um, it's not a methodological problem. Okay, then um, again, our multivariate normal density gives us a likelihood that looks a lot like the other one. We have again the, pi, the, the term in pi, which is a constant we don't worry about. We have the log of sigma squared, which is from the ass assumption of homoscedasticity. If we have heteroscedasticity, this is a little more complicated. Then we have our Jacobian term that doesn't go away. And then we have our weighted least squares, our spatially weighted least squares as, as the term in the end. So we use nonlinear optimization, first order conditions, second order conditions to get the asymptotic variance matrix. And that gives us a way to do asymptotic t-tests, and we're in business. And again, if you're interested in the technical details, the full derivation is in chapter six of the Spatial Econometrics book, um, and in my dissertation, if you want to go back that far. Um, interface is the same. You just click on a different button, one that says spatial error instead of spatial lag, and then the results come out in very much the same form. Lambda is now at the bottom. It gives you the estimate, asymptotic t-value, and so on. 
same measures of fit. Again, keep in mind the R square that is given here is not a regular R square. In fact, we probably shouldn't even report it. But so many people ask for an R square like measure, but it's really no good. You know, it, it's only a very crude indicator of fit, and um, I personally never use it. And I always rely on the maximized likelihood or the AIC if the models are very different specifications. Um, and that's basically it in terms of um, estimation. You know, the R result is the same type of information in a slightly different format, and, and you'll get a you get the pleasure of trying this during the lab, and I'll make sure I'm not around while you do it. And that is uh, where I'll stop today. So then this, in fact, ends the treatment of pure spatial correlation, pure spatial dependence. Then tomorrow we bring in the heterogeneity and see different ways in which we can uh, accomplish that and accommodate that. And the challenge there is to deal with situations where we have the two together. Regular regression, ordinarily scores regression, sometimes people try to tease out the relative contribution of various variables to explain the variance. Uh, so some sort of nested hierarchical model that will try to, you know, what's this, some the squares of this, some the squares of that, and so on. Uh, here, an interest might be in how important is the lag in terms of slicing out the, the variance into the, the space. But, but is, would you use the same kind of operation? How would you get at the like a sums of squares? I mean, is, is it a lag likelihood difference and do a chi square on it? Well, the, the any time, yeah, any time you have sums of squares in a spatial domain, it will not be appropriate because you need to, in fact, use spatially weighted sums of squares or sum of spatially weighted residuals. Um, some of the squares of spatially weighted residuals. Those are the proper ones to use. Uh, I haven't seen it used. Um, typically, the way you assess the relative importance of the lag versus the rest is by looking at a likelihood ratio test or looking at, um, you know, in an ad hoc manner, looking at how the R square changes. But the R square is a pseudo R square, but it gives you a, a qualitative idea in the following sense. If it goes from 0.3 to 0.7, you know you've added a lot by, in, by including a spatial lag. If it's a marginal change, then um, it's not that important. And the, 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 from a qualitative point of view, the real importance of including the lag is, if, unless you're really interested in spatial interaction, in which case whether it's positive or negative really matters, but it's to get a better estimate of the betas. And so one of the things that we found in several policy applications that ignoring the lag can give you a highly misleading estimate of policy effects. Say if you translate these coefficients and multiply them with dollars and things like that, they can be very different. And this is not just purely a precision issue, which is the case when you have a spatial error model. This is an actual point estimate issue as well. So we can find, for example, if you ignore the lag, you say that pollution abatement is important. If you don't ignore it, it's not important, or, or vice versa, these types of things. That's the main issue. Is, is there spatial lag to be extracted from the error by adjusting some of your parameters? I mean, is there any, as, as far as a judgment of uh, uh, perhaps how you specify the model? Well, the question is, is there spatial lag to be extracted from the errors? I think the real issue is um, after you have a satisfactory model, is that model still misspecified in some way? And so what you really want to look at at that point is the, the residuals of that model. But let me um, be very specific. The residuals of interest are not necessarily the difference between predicted value and observed value, because these are transformed residuals. The ones that enter into the likelihood function are not the p raw residuals, if you wish, but they are spatially filtered residuals. So then to look for patterns, 
you have to look at patterns in the spatially filtered residuals, not in the, what I call the raw residuals. And um, we'll discuss this in the lab, and there's some choices you can make in Geoda about what kind of residual you want to look at. Because, you know, if you just estimate by um, feasible generalized least squares, and you take those residuals, they still have the spatial effect in them. Because the, to get the spatial effect out of them, you have to spatially filter them too. And that is in fact what Geoda does. So it gives you two types of residuals. And in the workbook, there is an illustration. In one of them, if you do Moran's eye, it still looks like it's still correlated, and it is. But if you do the spatial filter, the Moran scatter plot falls flat, and then essentially you have removed the spatial autocorrelation. So it's important to always know where the line stops. And so to deal with the, the residuals that are compatible with the model. Why can't uh, adjusted R squared be put in Geoda using spatially filtered residuals? Well, it can. I just didn't feel like it. <laughs> the, uh, if you remember, space that has a, um, an, a spatially adjusted R square in it. But it's something that very few people use. And so, you know, in terms of costs and benefits, I just didn't feel like it. Uh, and also, I have a hidden agenda, or maybe not so hidden agenda. I want to focus attention away from R square and towards using the likelihood and the AIC and those measures as measure of model validity. There's lots of hidden agendas in Geoda, as you <laughs> will discover as you start using it. OK, let's take a quick break and change the scenery to the lab environment. And then um, I'll start uh, talking to you again after the demos.